Thank you for tuning into today's video. If you're a true crime enthusiast, welcome aboard. We release new content three times a week. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider liking this video as it greatly supports our channel. Don't forget to subscribe with notifications turned on to stay updated on all our future posts. On September 12, 1982, two off-duty Alaska police officers were hunting in a remote section of Alaska, approximately 20 miles away from Anchorage. The area was accessible only by plane or boat, thus generally attracting only seasoned hunters. But after a long day, the two men realized dusk was settling, and they found themselves still deep in the woods. They concluded it was time to retrace their steps and make their way back to camp. The journey through the woods was arduous, prompting them to traverse the nearby Kinnick River and cross an exposed sandbar. During their walk, they noticed a boot protruding from the sand. Upon closer examination, they discerned it wasn't just a boot. It also contained a human leg bone. Being police officers, they understood the significance of not disturbing a potential crime scene. Consequently, they marked their location on the map, left the area, and promptly reported the discovery to their department. The following day, forensic technicians arrived at the isolated site. They meticulously unearthed the remains, still clothed in women's garments. Their search in the vicinity yielded a single shell casing, a 223 caliber round commonly utilized for hunting rifles. The remains were sent to the laboratory for an autopsy. It was revealed that the deceased was a female, presumably perishing at least six months prior she had succumbed to three gunshot wounds with no corresponding bullet holes found on her clothing. It appeared she had been shot while unclothed and subsequently dressed. Moreover, a hospital bandage was discovered wrapped around her head, leading to speculation that she had been blindfolded before her demise. A couple of weeks after the post-mortem examination, dental records confirmed the identity of the body as that of 23-year-old Sherry Morrow, an exotic dancer from Anchorage who had been reported missing 10 months earlier. Her missing persons report indicated that her last communication with friends was about an offer of $300 to pose for a professional photographer with the meeting scheduled just before her disappearance. While the authorities were fairly confident that Sherry's killer was the alleged photographer, they lacked the evidence necessary to pursue the suspect. Their only lead was the shell casing commonly used by the substantial population of hunters in Alaska. The police publicized the discovery of Sherry's body, hoping that the information would encourage someone from the public to provide additional details. During the police's press conference, a reporter inquired whether they believed Sherry's death was linked to other unsolved deaths in that part of Alaska. This was a reference to two years earlier, when two other women's bodies had been found in the rugged area where Sherry was located. One of the women was so severely decomposed that identification was impossible, but it was presumed she was in her late teens or early 20s. The other woman was identified as 24-year-old Joanne Messina, also an exotic dancer from Anchorage. However, there was scant evidence at either of the two women's burial sites, leaving their deaths shrouded in mystery. At the press conference, the police publicly stated to reporters that they did not believe Sherry's death was connected to those of the other two women. Privately, though, some officers harbored suspicions. Not only had these three women met similar fates in the same vicinity, but over the past couple of years, there had been a noticeable surge in missing persons from Anchorage, primarily young women, many of whom were exotic dancers or prostitutes. This led many officers to believe they were dealing with a serial killer. Yet, Lacking tangible evidence, they could not make this assertion publicly. In the following year, no new information surfaced about Sherry Morrow or the other two deceased women found in the area. All three cases remained unresolved. Meanwhile, more exotic dancers and prostitutes continued to go missing from Anchorage, leaving authorities puzzled. Then, on June 13, 1983, the police caught a break. Early that morning, a man driving a truck turned onto a quiet Anchorage highway. As he drove, he noticed a woman running toward him, screaming with her hands raised above her head. 
She was not wearing pants or shoes and had a handcuff on one wrist. Sensing that something was amiss, he pulled over. As the woman hurried towards his vehicle, he realized she was much younger than he initially thought, likely in her late teens. Without seeking permission, she leaped into the passenger side, swiftly shut the door behind her, and crouched low to avoid being seen from outside the car window, as if she was attempting to evade someone or something. Understanding the urgency of the situation, the man made a spontaneous decision to transport the girl away from the area. He drove her to a nearby motel without asking any questions. The distressed girl implored him to leave her at the motel, and he complied. When the girl rushed into the motel, the receptionist was alarmed and immediately contacted the police. Within minutes, the authorities arrived, went up to the girl's room, and she granted them entry. Introducing herself as Cindy Paulson, 17 years old, Cindy appeared visibly terrified and non-threatening. The police removed the remaining handcuff from her wrist and began to listen to her account. Cindy's narrative was horrifying, yet what struck the officers was not just the disturbing nature of her story, but also Cindy's composed and courageous demeanor as she recounted the ordeal. Here is her story. The previous night, Cindy was soliciting on the streets of Anchorage as a prostitute. A car pulled up and inside sat a wiry, bearded man wearing glasses who appeared somewhat slim and non-threatening. He solicited her services, and because she did not perceive him as a danger, she agreed and entered the passenger seat. However, as soon as she sat down, he handcuffed one of her wrists and brandished a gun, instructing her to remain silent. He then drove her to a relatively affluent neighborhood, pulled into a driveway and ushered her into a house. In the dimly lit basement, she noticed a swinging chain from the ceiling. He hoisted her onto that chain and subjected her to hours of assault. After he grew weary of assaulting her, he informed her that he was going to take a nap and that upon his return, they would depart for his cabin in the woods. Desperate, she pleaded with him to release her, but he remained indifferent warning that any attempt to escape or make noise would result in her death. With that, he exited the room, leaving Cindy chained to the ceiling with some of her clothes removed, pondering the horrors that could befall her next. Eventually, the assailant returned to the room. He untethered her from the chain and escorted her upstairs to his living room, proudly displaying numerous hunting trophies. He enthusiastically shared his passion for hunting, detailing his preferred locations and practices. It was then that Cindy realized the man had no intention of letting her live. He had exposed his identity, his residence, his vehicle, and divulged details about his preferences and habits. She understood that she posed a significant threat to him, and if she didn't find a means of escape, she would meet her demise. Following the trophy exhibition, the man guided Cindy back to her car. He placed her inside and drove to a nearby small airport, claiming his plane was there. Pulling over near the hangar, he escorted her out of the car and onto the plane. As Cindy sat inside the aircraft, she observed the man loading numerous firearms and what appeared to be military supplies into the plane. Realizing this was her opportunity, she knew she had to escape immediately because once the plane took off, her fate would be sealed. At a certain point, when the man went to his car to retrieve something, his back turned to her, she leaped out of the plane's cockpit. After the fall, she swiftly regained her footing and sprinted out of the hangar. Bolting around the corner, she headed towards the forest as she heard the man pursuing her, shouting threats of capture and death. She continued running for her life until she reached the highway, eventually halting and glancing back. Observing that the man had ceased chasing her, she stepped onto the road and managed to flag down the man in the truck, who then transported her to the motel. The police were taken aback by her account, while it sounded implausible, her genuine fear and meticulous recollection convinced them of its authenticity. They informed her that she needed to be taken to the hospital. En route, she insisted that they return to the airport where she had been held, aiming to identify the hangar she had been in, and ideally, the plane would still be present. The authorities complied. They arrived at the airport and Cindy pointed out the hangar she believed she had been kept in, Upon reaching the location, they found the plane she had described, yet the man, her assailant, was nowhere to be seen. The officers disembarked and began documenting details about the plane, its unique identifiers, and its appearance. While they were there, the airport's security guard approached them, 
having noticed the police vehicles. He informed them that the previous night he had observed the owner of the plane in question acting suspiciously near his car. On a hunch, he had recorded the man's license plate number, which he then provided to the police. Using this information along with some of the numbers on the plane, the police managed to identify the owner as a local man named Robert Hansen, who operated a thriving bakery downtown. After dropping Cindy off at the hospital, the police officers decided to visit Robert Hansen at his residence. Upon their arrival, they coincidentally saw Robert pulling into his driveway, and they noted that his car matched the description given by Cindy. Robert himself also matched the description she had provided of her attacker. When Robert noticed the police cars outside his house, he promptly invited them in, asking, How can I assist you? The officers requested to speak with him, and Robert welcomed them inside. Upon entering his house, the interior matched Cindy's description, adorned with hunting trophies scattered throughout. They engaged him in conversation, questioning his activities the previous night. He claimed to have spent the evening with some friends, offering their contact information if necessary for verification. The friends would confirm his alibi. Seeking permission to search his property, the police asked Robert, who readily agreed, stating, feel free to look wherever you need to. Despite scouring the premises, the police found no evidence of the alleged attack. They expressed gratitude for his cooperation and departed. Upon returning to the station, they followed up with Robert's two alibi-providing friends, both of whom independently corroborated his story, affirming that he had been in their company during the specified time frame. Thus, as improbable as it seemed, Robert's account appeared to hold true. The police returned to Cindy and inquired, are you absolutely certain that all the details you provided are exactly as you remember? Is there any possibility of exaggeration? Are you certain this is the truth? Cindy responded, without a doubt. When they proposed a lie detector test to verify her statements, Cindy declined, stating, no. The reason for her refusal remains unclear. It might have stemmed from a general distrust of the police. Nevertheless, her denial immediately cast a substantial shadow of doubt over her narrative in the eyes of the authorities. Sensing the police's waning belief, Cindy became apprehensive and abruptly left town. Following her departure, her case and the matter of Robert Hansen largely faded from public attention. However, everything changed three months later on September 2nd. A construction crew working on a remote rural road not far from where the bodies of the three women had been discovered inadvertently unearthed human remains. The police were summoned and subsequently retrieved the remaining remains. Similar to the case of Sherry Morrow, upon investigating the new body, they discovered a lone shell casing from a .223 caliber round. The remains were subjected to an autopsy, revealing the deceased to be a 17-year-old female who had succumbed to multiple gunshot wounds. Utilizing dental records, they identified the woman as Paula Goulding, a 17-year-old exotic dancer who had gone missing five months earlier from Anchorage. The police sent the 223 shell casing recovered from Paula's burial site, along with the other 223 shell casing found at Sherry Morrow's burial site, to a laboratory for analysis. It was swiftly determined that both rounds had been fired from the same rifle, strongly suggesting that the same individual had likely murdered both women. This critical moment marked the realization that a serial killer was at large. While many officers suspected Robert Hansen, he had a solid alibi and no concrete evidence linked him to the crimes. With no other viable suspects, the authorities enlisted the help of renowned FBI profiler John Douglas to construct a profile of the suspected perpetrator behind the killings of Sherry Morrow and Paula Goulding. Upon the receipt of John's report, the police were astounded. The profile depicted a man in his 40s seamlessly blending into society. Well-liked and amicable, he appeared to be an ordinary individual, likely successful due to his ownership of a prosperous business. An enthusiastic outdoorsman and hunter, he probably had a distinct speech impediment such as a lisp or a stutter. The profile strikingly resembled Robert Hansen, given John Douglas's exceptional track record in accurately identifying killers based on his profiles, a judge, upon reviewing this specific profile and its uncanny alignment with Robert Hansen, granted the FBI a search warrant for Robert's residence. This time, 
they uncovered highly incriminating evidence, including a local hunting map with 37 X marks, some of which matched the locations where the bodies of the four women had been found. Additionally, they discovered a 223 caliber rifle and a bag of women's jewelry, among which was a necklace belonging to Sherry Morrow. As the FBI agents were transferring evidence from Robert's house to their truck, a concerned neighbor approached, drawn by the commotion. Approaching one of the agents with palpable unease, she disclosed, you know, my husband is friends with Robert, and he recently provided a false alibi for him. He had no clue about the gravity of the situation, and neither did I. However, I want you to know that my husband was lying. He was not with Robert on the night he claimed. This revelation proved to be the final blow for Robert Hansen, leaving him with no more shields to hide behind. When the police confronted Robert with the overwhelming evidence against him, including the discoveries in his house and the retracted statement from his former alibi, Robert declared, Fine, I will confess. However, he presented a condition. He was only willing to admit to the murders of the four women whose bodies had already been uncovered by the police. The authorities were aware that Robert likely had more victims, prompting them to focus on uncovering the identities and locations of these individuals. They proposed a deal to Robert, wherein he would confess to these four murders and provide additional information about his other victims, their whereabouts and the circumstances of their deaths. In return, they assured him that he would not be prosecuted for any other victims he named. Robert accepted the terms, affixing his signature to the agreement, and proceeded to provide a chilling, comprehensive confession. He divulged how he would cruise around Anchorage at night, scouting for young, vulnerable women who were alone. Often, these were prostitutes on the streets or exotic dancers who he would befriend inside clubs. Approaching these women, he would portray himself as a professional photographer, praising their beauty and offering payment for a photo shoot. Many of these women, aspiring models, eagerly accepted the proposition. Robert would instruct them to meet him the following day at a specific location, typically a fast food restaurant. However, Robert would arrive earlier and conceal himself in his car awaiting their arrival. If they appeared alone and without anyone to assist them, he would pull up and request that they enter his vehicle. Unbeknownst to the women, the passenger side door bore a handcuff secured to the door itself, with an open cuff ready for use. Upon their entry, he would seemingly assist them in fastening their seatbelt, swiftly maneuvering to restrain their wrist in the open handcuff. He would then brandish a pistol, pressing it against their temple while whispering, stay quiet. During his confession, Robert boasted to the police about the routine nature of his actions, stating that putting the handcuffs on and brandishing the pistol had become second nature to him. Once he had the women restrained in his car, he would drive them back to his residence and lead them into his basement, where he would secure them to the ceiling as Cindy had recounted. Following hours of assault, he would transport them from his basement to his car, then to the airport, and ultimately to his cabin, situated not far from where the four bodies had been discovered. Upon reaching his cabin, he would disrobe the women and blindfold them. Still handcuffed, he would usher them outside and instruct them to run, which they did, frantically sprinting through the woods, stumbling and colliding with trees, desperately fleeing from their captor, under the impression that they were finally free. Little did they know, their ordeal had just begun. Robert had no intention of permitting their escape. Aware that deep water surrounded his cabin, he knew that if the women managed to reach the water's edge, they would drown. Granting them a substantial head start to instill a false hope of escape, Robert would then arm himself with his knife and hunting rifle, embarking on a relentless pursuit of his prey. For hours or even days, he would trail them through the woods, silently observing their movements. Sneaking up on them, he would deliberately wound them, typically with his knife, ensuring a blood trail to follow. Tracking their agonized screams, he would approach them as they faced their imminent demise. With no hope left, they would collapse or surrender, prompting Robert to end their lives with a gunshot. Afterward, he would remove their handcuffs, redress them and bury them in shallow graves. Prior to being incarcerated for life without the possibility of parole, authorities escorted him to the hunting area to assist in locating additional grave sites. However, he could only identify eight more victims, 
as some of the sites had been disturbed by animals, or he had forgotten their precise locations, or deliberately withheld the information from the police. Robert never confirmed whether all 37 of the marked X's on the discovered map corresponded to actual victim burial sites, but investigators strongly believed that was the case. In fact, there were speculations of the existence of other maps with more X's, although law enforcement could only verify 17 victims. Any further details remain unknown, as Robert passed away in prison in 2014, taking those secrets to his grave. Hey friends, if you found today's stories interesting, please subscribe to our channel and enable notifications, ensuring you never miss our weekly uploads. Your support is invaluable as we bring you new stories every week. Until next time.